Good morning. Good morning. And a very warm welcome. How good it is to see you and how good it is to be here for worship together. Let's pray. O God who gives manna from heaven, you provided for Moses' followers in the desert. O Christ, bread of life, you fed the 5,000 with loaves and fishes. O Holy Spirit of the living God, hear with us as we come together today. Feed us now with all that we need and sustain us through the lives that lie ahead so that thus fed we may be satisfied and know you. In Jesus' name we come and worship. Amen. And uh, Roger, our organist, is on a well-earned holiday at the moment, so we have various uh, sources of music we can stand and join in singing with. Please sing from behind masks, and we stand and sing, or hail the power of Jesus.
every time we were searching for music to use on our YouTube services, I came across that one and never quite seemed right to use it, but today I did. It comes from Chennai in India, uh, southeastern India, and it reminded me when I watched it of um, my experience visiting the Methodist Church in uh, Sri Lanka. Now, to confuse Sri Lanka and India is like accusing somebody who's Canadian of being American. You don't do it. So this was not Sri Lanka, it's nothing to do with Sri Lanka, but it reminded me of the enthusiasm and the uh, 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 joy with which the people in Asia I met uh, joined in uh, worship of God. The edge to it, of course, was that it's a sign of imperialism, it's a sign of missionaries that have taken a whole culture out into Asia, as well as just Christian faith. So it was a fascinating, uh, but very Christian celebration. I'm fascinated by that recording, so appreciate the chance to be able to uh, invite us to share it. Let's come to God in prayer, and Bronwyn is going to lead us in our prayers, and then we're going to sing with ourselves a recording of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray together. Ever living God, source of power and love, all praise and glory belongs to you. Ever living God, source of forgiveness and hope, all praise and glory belongs to you. Ever living God, Shown to us in Jesus, your Son, all praise and glory belongs to you. Ever living God, constantly present in our lives by the Spirit, all praise and glory belongs to you. Ever living God, ceaselessly working in human history. All praise and glory belongs to you. Ever living God, head of your church, guide of your people, all praise and glory belongs to you. Lifting our voices before you, we sing your praise. Lifting our hearts before you, we rejoice that you are God. Lifting our lives before you, we pay you homage. Accept our worship, Lord, to the praise and glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a prayer of confession. Merciful Father, in your presence and in the company of your faithful people, we admit our faults. You taught us to love you with our whole being, but we confess that our discipleship has been lazy. We have been afraid of what others might think. We have missed opportunities for their witness. We have not loved you with our whole being. You have taught us to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. We confess that we can be the envious of those who have had more than we have. We have despised those who are different from us. We have been angry with those who disagree with us. We have not loved our neighbours as we love ourselves. Merciful Father, we know that in Christ you love and forgive us. You have made us your children and you will go on loving us. Help us to live by the strength and hope this faith gives us. Help us to overcome our sins and to trust you for the grace we need. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we sing together the Lord's Prayer.
Bible readings this morning on very similar themes of God providing food for his people. The Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 to 4 and 11 to 15. Bread from heaven. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam, and Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, where we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In the way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. The Lord then spoke to Moses again and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat. And in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading is taken from John, beginning at verse 24. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to the Pergamon, looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you made your food of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God, that God the Father has set his seal. <coughs> 31 to 35. Our ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Alison, and thank you, Leslie, for reading for us. We go to that uh, familiar conservatory in Market Drain now as we sing the splendour of the King.
the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great. I'm afraid we had to abandon the service that was being recorded in church on Sunday morning because somebody took ill, but you'll be pleased to know the ambulance was called. Uh, they were found to be well again and uh, sent home. Uh, so prayers were answered there. Uh, bless you. So we decided to continue this service and uh, record the bits and uh, edit it together. I hope it works for you. When I was on holiday a couple of weeks ago, I uh, went to uh, a very favourite uh, place of ours where um, I always like to go. And when we park in the car park down at one of our favourite beaches in West Wales, we look out over the uh, car park wall. And I always look at this uh, mound in the field there just before the beach and uh, pro proclaim to my family, repeat it every year, it's become a bit of a ritual. That's where a chapel used to stand in honour of St Patrick <clears throat> because he sailed from this beach when he went on mission to Ireland and uh, of course went to repeat it this year stood by the wall looked over to the mound and it wasn't there gosh it had moved because the archaeologists had moved in it was fascinating uh, there were some posters up which indeed did confirm all my uh, suspicions and my uh, reading to date and I looked at the um, chapel that was dated from the early middle ages um, and the archaeologists as you looked down into the hole uh, were all going about their work with their little uh, paintbrushes and uh, trowels and, uh, and uh, uh, digging very carefully 
They were excavating uh, Christian graves from the 8th to the 12th centuries. And I got chatting to uh, one of the uh, uh, guides there and it was a fascinating conversation. They knew they were Christian burials because they all uh, faced in a certain direction. Uh, they could see that there were uh, Christian people from all around the Mediterranean. So quite a huge geographical area. This wasn't just a local graveyard and various characteristics that we talked about. What I found fascinating was that the archaeologists could see some of the truths of what they were digging up because of the patterns that they could discern and comparing it to other uh, digs that they'd done and uh, material that was published. And as we look at these two Bible stories, I think it doesn't take much of a literary archaeologist, if you like, to see a pattern and to conclude that there are certain patterns and themes throughout the scriptures that the people who wrote them must have known they were attending to in the way that the people that buried uh, those Christians in the 8th to the 12th centuries in West Wales knew they were facing a certain direction and some of the characteristics uh, were repeated because of what they believed at the time. So in Exodus chapter 16, uh, we've got a story of people complaining. Well, there's an awful lot of that about. Uh, we're all good at complaining, aren't we? Um, and we know that we've had good cause possibly recently to complain. But they were complaining because they were hungry. In this story, uh, God has led the people out of Egypt and they've been wandering in the desert and they complain to Moses and say, look, we are hungry. At least when we lived in slavery in Egypt, we had meat to eat. And in the New Testament, too, in the story uh, uh, of uh, Jesus in John chapter six, the people were hungry and they had uh, been fed with the bread and the loaves of the, the story of the feeding of the 5000 that just comes before this. But they'd followed Jesus around the lake because they were hungry for more food and more spiritual depth. The second thing we can discern in the story from Exodus is that God gave them what they needed They'd never seen it before, this strange what's called manna in the wilderness. I think the nearest thing to it is uh, a sort of uh, some of the crisps that we get today. Um, uh, skips or, you know, those sort of uh, uh, crumbly sort of crispy uh, sort of crisps that we get that were, were crunchy. But as they got to grips with what God had given them, they had a new realisation that this was, although God was providing for them, it wasn't bread, it wasn't meat, it was something they'd never had before. So they had to learn something new. And when uh, the 5,000 were fed with the loaves and the fish in the story that comes just before the one we read, uh, they were left wanting more. They had to learn something new. And that's what this uh, writing of John is doing, capturing something of what Jesus was trying to teach them about what's new. It's not just physical food or spiritual food. It's a deep sense of sustenance that comes from God to his people. And the third uh, reflection in Exodus was that at the end of the story, God said, so that you will know that I am your God. It was all about the people's relationship with God. They complained, he gave them something, they had to learn something new, but it was part of their ongoing relationship with their God. And these stories date from centuries ago when it was their God rather than anybody, other, uh, anybody else, any other God or the gods of any other of the nations uh, around them at the time. And the comparison to that, the repeat of the pattern, if you like, in John chapter six is we lead up to this uh, famous and uh, thundering verse that comes from Jesus. I am the bread of life. It's about my relationship with you, says Jesus, who I am and how I relate to you and how you can relate to me. I'm like bread. You need me. You feed on me. I sustain you. So there's a pattern that we see in the scriptures. But what does that mean for us today? How can we relate to it in our situation? Hunger, hungry. It's a strange reflection, isn't it? Somebody said recently, um, what kind of world do we live in in the West, in, in civilised, uh, so-called civilised Western uh, nations? Where the wealthy people are the slim ones and the overweight ones are the hungry ones. We have so much 
wrong with our society to do with hunger and food and wealth and poverty that we are really in a mess, I think. We are amongst the most well-fed, satisfied people in human history, in the history of the planet. And yet we have ready meals, we have McDonald's, we have motor cars and computers to sit in front of. We don't get our exercise. We don't go out to fetch our food. We can have it delivered to the door. And uh, most of our food is saturated with fat and salt and sugar, although figures are coming down supposedly. And I know I struggle with my own weight and my own uh, eating. It is so easy, so easy to pile on the pounds and so difficult to try and stay healthy. But we have that choice. Yet we are a hungry people, hungry for mental health and well-being, hungry for peace and what the Bible calls shalom, that sense of deep well-being uh, for us as individuals and between us uh, and between each other in society. Well, into that hunger, Jesus says, I am the Prince of Peace. I am the one who to know me is to know peace of mind, a calm of spirit, a sense of well-being. We're a people that are hungry for wisdom and for truth, hungry to know whether it's the science or the politicians. What does David Attenborough say? What do the other politicians say? The, the leaders, the scientists, we're hungry to know what is the state of our world and our society and what the answers are. And into that hunger for wisdom and for truth comes Jesus, who is called the Word of God. And it strikes me <clears throat> that in our world today, we are hungry for justice. We are hungry for goodness. We are hungry for what's right, what's sustainable for our planet, for our, our global climate. We are hungry for, for justice and goodness when it comes to sustaining the planet through, through forestation, reforestation, through uh, biodiversity, uh, through the bees that we've been talking about. If you've been listening to the radio recently, the life of the pollinators. We are hungry for a sense of things to be right with the world. And into that, into that hunger comes Jesus saying, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. So when the people were fed in their stories, their hunger was satisfied, they had to learn. They had a new thing to discover and to learn it. And I think we are learning again in our world today, aren't we? We are learning as the pandemic uh, comes to an end. It'll never be quite over, I don't think, for a long time yet. But we're, we're learning to be kind to one another. We've all been affected by the pandemic, by lockdown, by being shut in, by children being educated at home, people losing their jobs. So much that we are learning. We've got to be kind to each other as we relate to each other coming out of this situation and to value what's important. We valued the NHS, the key workers, some of the simple things in life, uh, our food, our families that we haven't been able to see for months, over a year, some people. We value what's important. We're learning those simple values again and appreciating people. One of the things we're learning in the church is that what's traditional doesn't work anymore. We were in decline before the pandemic. We've zoomed right, well, we've zoomed anyway. <laughs> we've shot into huge decline uh, now as we come out. There's a lot of people still not coming out to church, but have discovered new ways of being church. We're developing hybrid church, which is why you're watching this service on, uh, on Zoom, as well as uh, it being in a building. Uh, 10.30 service at Wesley Place is no longer our priority as a church. We have got to put our energies into other things, into sustaining each other, into contacting each other, making new contacts, finding our way forward as a church. Everything's changing and we are learning new stuff about church, about what we're good at, who we are, who God's calling us to be. And for us as a church at Wesley Place, that's meant we've learned to pray together. We've learned to keep fellowship and Bible study going by Zoom uh, through the pandemic. Uh, we have uh, developed our discipleship. There's songs of praise. There's worship on Zoom that you can watch from all over the place. Uh, things on YouTube that we can watch. Uh, Zoom services we can pop into. Some people have found themselves never fed 
as much and never growing as much as Christian disciples as they have done over the last few months. We've learnt to sustain ourselves and to find that deep spiritual sustenance that we've perhaps been lacking over the years because of the habits we'd got into. We've learnt to value life and to live it. Our family have never been uh, big on foreign holidays and uh, we've learnt to value the simple holidays we're able to have. We love camping, we've got an old caravan now and we, we just love parking it in a field somewhere on the edge of a farm somewhere and just resting and enjoying the natural world, being away together, not a million miles away, but enjoying the simple things in life. What are we learning as we emerge from this pandemic? And the final reflection from, uh, uh, from Exodus, uh, God said, you will know that I am your God. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I issue a bit of a challenge, I think, uh, today to rediscover Jesus and to ask ourselves that question again. Who do I think Jesus is? Research uh, conducted, I think, by the Bible Society and uh, other organisations, maybe not the most neutral or scientific, but it was research, it was figures done, suggests that, that about a third, less than a half, a third to a quarter maybe, of adults and young people believe that Jesus actually ever existed in our world today. Yet to Christian people, it's just an assumption that Jesus existed. If you go to the um, uh, uh, black uh, community, the BAME groups of, uh, of the United Kingdom, the figures go up. There's more people in the black community believe that Jesus existed and believe in Jesus that he was who he said he was. Fascinating research. But the question is again for all of us, who do we say Jesus is? What did he come for? Did he exist? Why? What do we remember? What do we learn? What can we learn as we read those gospel stories? And I think I've said it before, we need to be reading Matthew, Mark, Luke and John over and over and over again and re-hearing what God was saying through Jesus Christ. And then we need to be still, to pray, to talk together, discover who Jesus is today. He is alive. What does he mean for us? What does he mean in your life and mine? What does it mean to pray and commune and feed on Jesus every day, every week, and to share that in fellowship with other people? He feeds the hungry. He leads the wandering and the lost. He is water to the thirsty. In the gospel stories, the challenge that Jesus gives is that he usurps the place of the emperor as the divine human being. And the Christian message in that early Roman civilization and Jewish civilization uh, was here in Jesus is God human in our midst and that blew the minds of certain people what does it mean today for us to be relating to Jesus who is alive post-pandemic as we emerge as we re-enter society and social life together again we are a hungry people and God feeds us as God feeds us what is the new stuff that we learn and as we learn who God is we rediscover who Jesus is. Let's do that as we continue our journey as Christian people together. That's my reflections. What would you say, each one of you, as you ponder these stories? Amen. We come now to our prayers of intercession. Let us pray together. Lord, you came that we might know you as the bread of life and that we might know life in all its fullness. We thank you for all our experiences of the life you give. We come now to bring our prayers to you. Lord, we pray for the world, for those with power within it, that in their exercising of their power over others, they may be ruled not only by their heads, but by loving hearts. That wisdom may be informed by compassion that justice may be tempered with mercy, that policies may be determined by human need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Lord, we pray for the peoples of the world. We bring to you our concerns for those who suffer, for those who are suffering because of natural disasters, recent floods, forest fires, and for those still struggling because of the pandemic. We pray for the persecuted and oppressed, the hungry and destitute, and the victims of war. Lord, we pray with compassion. We ask that you will fill our hearts with such love, that may we, we may work with you to bring the love and peace that you give into this suffering world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray now for those who seek a deeper relationship with God. Lord, we pray for those who seek to know and to love you better, for those looking for a purpose in life, and those who feel attracted to the Christian faith. For those filled with doubt about your existence or the power of your love. For those who doubt their own commitment or their own claim to be your followers. For those new to the Christian faith and for more and for mature Christians facing new challenges. And for Christians everywhere as we each strive towards the perfection of love that we see in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the fellowship and spiritual growth of our church, community, here at Wesley Place. For the deepening of our commitment to one another and a greater sharing of our faith within the community of all Saviour. For fuller, richer acts of worship and for a visit vision for the future. Lord, we ask that through our humble sharing of life and worship, with one another, we may together grow into the full glory of Christian maturity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those from within our church who are sad or who are suffering at this time. For those ill in mind or body, those in hospital, for those who have been bereaved, for those filled with anxiety, and for those changes, facing changes in their lives. Lord, we ask that in you we may be one with one another and so bear one another's burdens with courage and love. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We make our prayers in the name of him who makes life rich and full, our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Sprinkles now. 
So a big thank you to Andrew who has edited this service, put so much work in to make it work beforehand, to Alison and to Bronwyn and to Leslie who've taken part with readings and prayers. My name's Rob Hilton, Methodist Minister in Old Sager in Cheshire South and I hope and pray that you will be blessed by God. Join me if you know the words. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Bye for now.